Hello Sudbury.com viewers, editor Mark Gentili here. We have a very special uh, afternoon event. We're sitting down with author uh, Camilla Gibb, uh, the author of Sweetness in the Belly, which is a 2005 novel that has been ad adapted into a 2019 film starring, among other people, Dakota Fanning uh, in the lead role. It's screening at Sudbury Indie Cinema this week, uh, two screenings on October 22nd. We hope you already bought your tickets because those shows are sold out, but special treat, you can sit down and watch me talk with Camilla about the book, about the film, about Islam, about a whole bunch of other things. So uh, Camilla, I want to thank you for joining us here today on Sudbury.com. Thank you so much, Mark. It's great to be here. So you made it up to Sudbury. I did. I drove. From Toronto. Yes. Decided not to fly. Yeah. Good leaving idea. Leaving the hot spot. I drove. It was nice. Is this your first sort of trip up to uh, Northern Ontario or have you been no, up No, I think before? it's my third, but okay. I've, I haven't spent a lot of time in Sudbury, but I've been to the French River, the Spanish River, okay. Killarney. Okay, um, so you've been in the Northeast then? Yes, and usually in summer, uh, doing outdoorsy things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautiful. Oh, nice. So, very different weather from, uh, from Ethiopia where the, uh, where the novel is set, Yeah. or mostly set anyway. Well, you'd be surprised. Ethiopia is largely highlands. Okay. So, in fact, the temperature is quite, uh, well, it's certainly moderate in the, in the highlands. Like Addis Ababa, I think, is 8,000 feet above uh, oh, wow. sea level. Okay. Harar is, I can't remember, po possibly the same in the, in the eastern part of the country where I lived. Um, and so it's, it's fairly moderate. There are two rainy seasons. It's not sweltering heat, as oh, you nice. might imagine. So it sounds like a nice place to, uh, to visit. Yes, beautiful place to visit. Yeah. Now, the, 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 the movie, Let, I want to start with the movie, if we, okay. if we could start with that. So uh, the movie had kind of a long kind of, uh, I think it was uh, you know, optioned in 2010. It took about, or, or, or earlier maybe you told me, and it, mm -hmm. it took a, a quite, a, quite a long time to, to come to fruition. Mm -hmm. uh, can you kind of talk a little bit about that and how that came about? Sure. Um, so it was initially optioned probably soon after it uh, was published maybe 2006 and seven for two years by a director. Um, it didn't get off the ground. And then a production company came to me, uh, Sienna Films in Toronto. Uh, two women, Jennifer and Julia, came to me to tell me how they really connected with this story, this book that they'd read. And it seemed to me that Jennifer had a very personal connection to the material. I could tell she felt moved by it. And she was determined, you know, should I give them the option to, to try? Um, to film this in Ethiopia, which I just thought was hugely ambitious and incredible. And I could never have imagined that somebody would have taken a project like that on. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, you're always cautioned as an author that only 2% of books that are optioned for film ever make it to the screen. So you don't want to get too attached. And so then the years tick by, right? And it's tricky. It's an independent film. How do you marshal all the resources? You know, how do you, how do you, how do you put all that package together? It's a labor of love, really. And you know, there were shifts in, in funding, there were shifts in um, principal actors. And so 10, almost 10 years later after, yeah, almost 10 years later, they set off for Ireland first, which served, Dublin served as a proxy for London in the film. And then they set off for Ethiopia. Uh, and they actually filmed it there with Ethiopian crew, an Ethiopian director, which is also another reason why I was so passionate about the, the uh, I was so enthusiastic about the fact that they were going to do this. Um, so it was an Irish, Canadian, Ethiopian co-production. Wow, that's uh, very international. Very, yes. Now, uh, you've seen the movie. The book is your baby. Clearly the book and the movie are very different things. Yes. What's your take on the movie? You've seen it. What, what, what was your impression as someone who sort of, you know, I mean, you gave birth to this novel. I mean, it's yeah. your story. It comes from your imagination. To see it sort of translated onto the screen, first impressions from you, just it, that experience as an author, seeing that happen. As you said, very few books that are optioned actually ever yeah. make it to the screen. So I think, I mean, there have been different reactions. Um, I mean, my... my to the, the first time I actually sat down and watched it, um, in a rough, a rough cut, I suppose that's what it's called. Um, just to see it visually, uh, just to see the colors in this place that I, that I had lived in, that I knew, and to see people, my char the characters in my head embodied. Like, I'm not good at describing people's physical, corporal selves. Like, I'm, I know what their heart feels like or what their soul feels like, but I don't know, uh, I don't know what they look like necessarily. It's usually a kind of something I add on later because I feel obliged to. So to see them 
as real people was something. And then to see the moment when Dakota and y Yaya, who's her, this young idealistic doctor with whom she's fallen in love, to see them together on the page, I was just, I had a very emotional reaction to it. Like I just blubbed. Oh. I just blubbed throughout the whole thing. I was overwhelmed. So the first couple of screenings, that's all I could do was cry. Yeah. I couldn't be objective about it. I couldn't sit back from it. And just to go back to what you said, it is a different beast, right? Like, I was never asked if I wanted to write the screenplay. I wouldn't, I would never have, I, I, no one should have asked me. Like, it's just like, I was so happy that a professional person who knew how to write screenplays would write this play. I told the story in one way. I didn't want to, to tell it in another way, but I was happy to let someone else do it. Yeah. And recognizing that you can't possibly convey there's a, there's a lot of pages in a book and a lot of complexity in that story. Um, they would have to just make choices that, you know, would hold it together as a coherent story of its own. Yeah. I'm curious to see the movie, too, because it flips, I mean, you flip back and forth through time periods. The book is not a straight narrative. You know, you start in, you know, you're in London and then you're going back in time to Ethiopia and then you're jumping forward again. And uh, it, uh, is the, is it, uh, is that the movie follow that a similar format as, well, as the... You know, it's interesting because I was a younger writer then and I'm, I don't know that I even knew at that point how to create a flashback. So it's not written like here we are in the present in London and I'm flashing back. It's like yeah. they're separate worlds. Yeah. Um, and that kind of serves a purpose, even though it's probably due to my lack of skill at that point as a writer, but kind of serves a, a purpose of these are two disconnected worlds in some mm -hmm. ways. And we're trying to make, Lily, for example, is trying to, to find her, her lost lover, as are many people trying to find their relatives. And there's so little communication between these two worlds because, you know, it's behind an iron curtain now yeah. from 1974 on. And now I've lost track of your question. Uh, which, you answered it. It was just sort of about what's the, you know, the, the, the... Uh... Oh, yeah. So in the movie, um, well, in fact, what's interesting is that uh, there's about a four page, four to six page in the book backstory, which is Lily was actually abandoned by her parents who are English, English and Irish, when they're traveling throughout North Africa. She's abandoned at a Sufi shrine in Morocco. So you kind of need that context to understand w why she is the committed Muslim that she is and how she has grown up studying under this particular sheikh. Um, how do you communicate that piece efficiently in the movie? That's tricky too, because then, then it becomes very confusing. You're moving between Morocco, Ethiopia, and London. Mm -hmm. um, and so they had to make kind of careful choices about how to, how to communicate all that history without confusing the viewer. The, uh, I want to I want to ask you what the movie got right and maybe what the movie got wrong. Mm. But one thing that just struck me when I was reading it, the 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 book opens um, talking about hyenas. Yes. <laughs> and I kind of wanted to get your did that did you did that come later in the process of writing the book? What did the hyenas mean to you? What did you intend the reader to take? I mean, I, yeah. I had my own sort of impression of of uh, of who the uh, of what the hyenas were supposed to be telling me. I, I you know, but I, I kind of wanted to get your take on this because I, I like that opening very much. I think the opening it's a prologue, isn't it? Yeah. You've read it more recently than I have, so forgive me. Um, <laughs> it is a prologue that you um, wrote among the in aspects your book. in my book. Um, it's a moment, it's kind of, I'm trying to portray a typical day in Harar, in this walled Muslim city, um, and, but a day when something shifts, something goes slightly wrong, and, and everything is about to change. And so um, among, and that, and in fact, that was written, that was written about halfway through the novel. Oh, really? It's kind of in anticipation of the, the revolution that was about to occur. And, um, but I, I pulled it out because it, it kind of captured all these very visual and sensory elements of this place that I was about to take a reader to. Mm -hmm. um, and the hyena's role, it was fascinating because as I said, I lived there and they have in the wall, which was built in you know, the 1500s, they, there are these holes that they call waraba nujul, which is a hyena hole. They're also used for drainage um, and historically there, were, there wasn't any kind of sewage system or water system and so everything kind of would run downhill and out. But it was also a way that a walled city that was locked at night, hyenas could sneak in. Um, hyenas would deal with garbage dis disposal. You could chuck yeah. it out in the street. Very efficient waste elimination system. But then there was also 
uh, different beliefs. I mean, it was a mixed population. They weren't just uh, Muslim Hararis. There were Christian Am Amharas and Oromos. And the Amharas believed that uh, if you found the eyebrows of a hyena, which I can't really remember seeing, but I gather they're quite long, <laughs> you can, and fashioned a bracelet, you could ward off the evil eye. Yeah. And the evil eyes, you know, it's a very, it's Middle Eastern, it's Mediterranean, it's a shared kind of mm -hmm. cultural notion, isn't it, about a way of warding off evil. Yeah. Yeah. The, the characters themselves are sort of hyenas in many ways through the book. I mean, and there's this interesting relationship. or? I, well, there's or, this sort of interesting relationship that the people have with the hyenas where oh, they yes. are, they, um, you know, they have the whole, they allow them in to clean up the streets. They, mm -hmm. they, uh, but at the same, there, there's sort of almost a symbiotic relationship, but it's a deadly symbiotic relationship because there are, if you are caught outside of your compound at night, you're going to get eaten by you a hyena. You can get eaten by a hyena. And one way to kind of, uh, you have to appease them every year. And so there's a kind of a ritual every year where porridge, a por special porridge is made. Mm -hmm. And they do it at a couple of shrines outside the city walls where they invite the hyenas to come and feast. And there's this, you know, if the, if the hyenas completely devour what you've prepared for them, um, they're, they're, they're not satiated, so you're in, you're in danger. Your city is in danger. They're kind mm -hmm. of like guardians of the city. You have to, it's, a, it's kind of complicated negotiation with them. And then if they eat too little and you haven't made a good, good enough porridge, you're, you're in danger. But if they eat half, then you know that it's kind of, kind of going to be equilibrium, mm -hmm. sort of between nature and, and urban, the, the natural and urban landscape. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah. Now, the, I'm just going to switch gears on you a little bit, and, and I want to talk about the film. Now, I, I kind of, from your perspective as the as the writer, I kind of want to know what you think the filmmakers got right, and what you think the filmmakers maybe missed the mark on, if anything. Maybe they didn't. Maybe that, they made that's a perfect tricky. movie. I'm I'm not that objective about it. I just feel I I love these women so much and what they were able to accomplish. I think it's absolutely extraordinary what they were able to do. So it's hard for me to be objective about it. Um, I do think that movement between Morocco, I think that, I don't think we gr the, the movie is ground enough quite in Lily's past. So it's hard maybe to understand how is it that this white woman has arrived in this place. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to understand the kind of the depth of her connection to her faith and the world in which she grew up. I think that's, that's tricky. I did see in the, in the it's interesting in the movie because I think the emphasis really shifts toward female friendship, particularly the friendship mm -hmm. between uh, Amina, who's a refugee she meets in London, um, and, and the community association they build together. That was, um, that was very much there in the book, but in fact, you know, Lily's a complicated character. You can never really access her. There's a kind of opaqueness and a sort of a remove to her. Yeah, a veil. A veil is a good way of putting it. And in the book, to me, the person she is closest to uh, is Amina's husband. Once he returns, uh, well, he and his wife Amina are reunited, but he's not all there either. He's a man who's been injured and tortured in prison for the past, you know, maybe 10 years. And there's something there in that relationship that I see and that I feel that I think is the closest relationship in the book, but it's so mm, nuanced, right? So yeah. how do you capture that? So in fact, the emphasis of where the most important relationships lie is different in the film, which isn't a criticism. I think it would be too difficult in a way to get into something so subtle, which is almost, I don't know if I should put it this way, but it's like there's a recognition of injury and a recognition of care that someone needs. Yeah, so much of what you, uh, so much of the way you tell the story is internal, mm -hmm. you know, and which is obviously cl clearly difficult to, to translate uh, to a visual medium. That's like right, film. And, and you know, even the the use of voiceover that that uh, it's not as as kind of frowned upon as it once was, mm -hmm. but yeah, how do you convey so much of that? Yeah. I think Dakota did a remarkable job in in terms of you know she's a character who doesn't Lily is a character who doesn't say that much actually but and there's a kind of stillness to her face and it's all in her eyes you can see it yeah but it's complicated you know and and painful in some ways i found myself wondering when i read the book what her accent would be mm. it well it's british mm -hmm. um, but she has trouble with english like you mentioned it several times in the book that she has trouble speaking english like she has it's like she's forgotten 
so much of the language that she sure. was born speaking? You know, it's a really great question because when I was writing the book, I mean, does she have trouble with English in terms of the finding the words or mm -hmm. expressions? Uh, and obviously she hasn't grown up in that culture. So she has none of the kind of the idioms of, of English of her generation. Um, but I don't know that I knew what her accent would sound like. Yeah. And so that was a choice that the director and the producers um, made. Interesting. Yeah. Now, you wrote the book in 2005. You told me that you started writing it prior to 2001, prior to 9-11. The book came out in the height of, uh, you know, the war on terror, the height of, of uh, rhetoric about, about Islam and rhetoric about uh, Muslims. And, and I kind of wanted to... Um, you, you have said in previous interviews that you, 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 you intended the book not to, to provide a sort of a different perspective maybe mm -hmm. on the belief system of Islam. Fifteen years later, mm -hmm. what's, your what's your perspective on, on where we've gone, on, on the meaning of the book, on, on perceptions of, the, of, of Islam as a religion, on Muslims as people? I know that's a big question. It's a big question. Um, I mean, I, I guess my hope in some ways was for, uh, you know, non-Muslim readers to, to encounter a world beyond the stereotypes that we were seeing, um, to, to, to expose readers to something I'd been exposed to, which was much softer and um, nuanced and sophisticated, um, complex world, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, where notions like, there were notions like jihad became a very important notion because that was a word we suddenly were familiar with in the wake of 9-11. Um, but the way I had understood it in the context of living in Harar was it's an internal struggle. You know, jihad is, a, is your own holy war against your sort of more base instincts. Yeah, as explained by the character Hussein, I think, Hussein. Who, is, who accompanies uh, ah, Muli. That's another, okay, so Hussein is not in the movie. Oh. And that, to me, is another kind of integral, in, essentially close relationship. Yeah. It's interesting that they're both with men, too, but it's mm -hmm. the female friendship that gets foregrounded um, in the movie. Uh, yes, uh, she has these teachers and, and, and guides who, you know, in some way, I'm, I'm taking Lily into a world, I'm taking the reader along with Lily. They're both outsiders encountering but wanting to belong in this place and, and learn of it. So what I would say in the aftermath is I would say we've lived, we live in a, you know, an, in, an even more divided world, you know, so my hopes for greater understanding, I think, I mean, we couldn't live in a more kind of polarized time, could we? Yeah, no, we, you, you are right there. We, we are very more, far more polarized today than I think we were in 2005 when the book was published. Yeah, and certainly in the last four years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. what do you, is there something that you were hoping people would take, uh, would, would, in particular that they would learn about Islam as a, as a religion from reading the novel? From reading it's the not story? so much about is Islam, it's about more about... Um, I mean, yes, there's the political drop backdrop of that, but I thought, you know, this is really a book about where do we belong? Um, you know, how do we create meaningful relationships in our lives, especially when, uh, you know, we, our lives have been marked by dislocation, disruption, um, forced migration, exile. You know, how do you, all the, there are all these kind of severed roots. And, and so it, it becomes more, I think, a story of, um, you know, refugees and also migrant experience. Mm -hmm. And I think for so many of us, we've left worlds behind that we can access, but it's starting anew, isn't it? And how do you, how do you make sense of your life in a new cultural context? How do you create meaning and family? Yeah. Yeah. I want to ask you about the phrase and the title, Sweetness in the Belly. Oh, yeah. I, I, where, where does that come from? Where, what was the germ of that of Because that it title? doesn't really mean anything, does it? <laughs> I, I, it depends. I, I think it, it, it you know, there, it, yeah. you, the one occasion where I, I remember it being used, I, I, is it, was it used more than once in the book? Because I, I can only remember one occasion late in the novel where the phrase is actually in the text. Yes. And it's after, uh, it's, a, it, it's in context of Lily and, her, and her, the, the man that she loves, Aziz. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, so when I first had the kind of the germ of a voice, which was Lily's voice, because I wanted to go back to this place. It's... I had a, one relationship to it, which was I was there as, uh, you know, doing academic research. And I wanted to go back 
to this place through a different lens. Um, and when Lily's voice kind of arrived, she sort of, you know, it sounds a bit hokey, but she kind of told me her story from the beginning. So um, the, her parents, some about her kind of peripatetic upbringing in Europe, and then her parents abandoning her at this shrine. But before that, you know, it's a, it, this poor kid, she just wants some kind of continuity and regularity. Stability, and she, yeah. Stability, and she, she'd like a friend, you mm -hmm. know. And so I think they were in Spain, and the, the parents are about to uproot her again, and she's made friends with this little girl. I think her name was Esme. And um, she, Esme gives her a gift because she's leaving, and she thinks, I don't have anything to give to this friend. So she says to her mother, I have nothing. You know, could I give her my toothbrush? And the mom says, no, why don't you give her this? And she pulls a bead off her necklace and gives it to Lily. And Lily goes over to Esme and proudly presents it to her. And Esme just pops it in her mouth and swallows it. <laughs> and she says, no, it's, it's for wearing. It's not for eating. And then I don't, she doesn't say sweetness in the belly then, but she thinks about it and she thinks it's okay. This way she's going to carry me around with her. You know, and that's, that's kind of where the meaning came from. Oh, I like that. But that story got exiled. Actually, you know, the first draft of this was 300 pages of Lily's life up until arriving in Harar. Oh, okay. And then it was my editors, because I thought I had a book, and I was like, ta-da! And my editors, <laughs> editors said, you know, that's fine, but who's this person as an adult? And I was just like, oh my god. I've just written the backstory. I've spent yeah. three years writing the backstory. But it did enable me to, I think I was trying to avoid, by keeping her as a child, I was thinking in some ways I was trying to avoid taking on the really big political issues. Mm -hmm. um, but this forced me to grow up, you know? First her to, forced her to grow up, forced me to grow up. Yeah, and I, you know, I, like you, you know, we've just, you know, Lily is a, is a really complex character. And I, I don't know if that, I, I'm not, a, maybe, you know, it's your book, but uh, I, I don't know if that <laughs> complexity would have, been as fleshed out or would have come through as strongly if, had you not spent that time to kind of imagine who this girl was as a child and what, you know. You know. I think it's probably a good exercise, you know, for any characters to kind of it, it, not necessarily to spend three years <laughs> and write 300 pages, but to, to, to know them as children mm -hmm. and to know what informs who they are as, as adults. Yeah. Yeah. The, now, you, by training, you, you're a social anthropologist, yeah? Yeah. Where does the writing come from? Like, did you, had you, did you intend on, you, I, you know, I, yeah. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to meander this way, and then, but eventually I'll get to writing, but... Uh, I didn't, you know, I wanted to be, actually, I wanted, when I was, I remember saying to my, my mom that I wanted to be a poet. Um, <laughs> those, those are the words that every parent wants to hear. <laughs> and then we went to the ROM, the Royal Ontario Museum, and then I told her I wanted to be an archaeologist. And so it's kind of funny that I should then, I studied social anthropology and, and Middle Eastern studies. Um, and then, you know, it was something about the academic language, particularly in relation to that work I had done in Ethiopia. I, I felt like it didn't do it justice. I felt like it excluded more people than it included. Mm -hmm. I felt that my friends in Harar couldn't read it, not because they couldn't read English, but because it was very technical. I felt like it lacked heart and color, and it just felt like a kind of dead thing. Yeah. And, um, uh, but you know, I couldn't, at that point, I couldn't just go, oh, oh I'll write a novel about it. Like, I, I viewed it through a particular lens with certain questions, and, and I was very trained in this academic language. So I found the only way, I had started rebelling a bit as a uh, graduate student. I'd started writing short stories, coming back to something, you know, just playing with language. And um, I really had to write two novels before I was... I had unlearned that academic language enough sufficiently that I could approach this story in a different way through mm -hmm. the lens of fiction. So I had to write two novels, and I had to write novels about things that I had never touched as, or even seen as an academic, because um, I could approach them in a very fresh way. So basically, I plundered my own family. <laughs> 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 write what you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, very nice. Now, 15 years on, just to continue with talking about writing, you know, a lot of people say that, you know, as a, you know, something that you've written or something you've created is never really finished, you know, you just put it down. And, you know, you've heard, I'm sure you've heard that phrase many times. When was the last time you actually read the book? You know, 
um, when I had this invitation to come to Sudbury, I thought... I better read the book. I better read the book. <laughs> and then I also had an invitation to... It's the Frankfurt Book Festival is happening now, the book fair. And um, uh, I think Canada is, a, is, a, is sort of the, the spotlit spot country this year, although it's all online. So I did an event with about book to film with um, Cameron Bailey from TIFF mm -hmm. and with the di director, Zima Resne. Uh, remote, he was in Addis and the two of us were in Toronto. And I thought in advance of that, I should read the book. And I just never managed to read the book. <laughs> um, how can I explain it? I don't know, there was a reluctance to go back. And I think, I think it's because I'm a different writer now. I've just finished ano writing another novel, I'm much sparer with words and I'm much more, I don't know, um, just a different writer and you know one cringes because I'm sure it's fine <laughs> but you, know, you don't want to even go back to your earlier work yeah. because you're just going to see, you're going to criticize it and you're going to see the flaws and you're going to be feel uncomfortable and you're going to say that's not, I would have worded it differently or yeah. that's not who I am now. So, Are there, uh, I, I'm curious, continuing on the same track, I'm curious what um, parts of the novel you feel like, and I understand not wanting to go back and, 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 and look at it and, and, uh, and cringing, because you know, as someone who, who writes, not in the same way you do, but as someone who writes for a living, I, I look back at things I may have written in the past and go, God. <laughs> yeah. What do you think you did well in the novel? Mm. I think, for me, the big challenge was how to move away from it being a kind of ethnographic description of a place and a people. And I remember my editor at Doubleday, um, we, we've had kind of, in some ways, parallel lives. She had done a degree in his, a PhD in history and written about women's lives and was not happy with the way she had to write about them and think about them in a, through an academic lens. So when I was first writing, the kind of more grown-up draft of this book, I would explain the complexity of ethnic relationships in this city by saying, you know, there were five prominent ethnic groups. And she just looked at me and said, who cares? Like, why can't they be farmers and they be the landowners? And I was like, because it's not, you know, it's <laughs> not, it's so much more complex than that. She's yeah. like, the reader does not need for it to be this complex. You know, so getting rid of how to, how to leave the reality and serve, serve the, the fiction. Just as someone who read the book and, and, and enjoyed it, I, I thought you did a really, I, I found those relationships and I think you did a good job of, of establishing the social hierarchy mm. uh, in, uh, in Harar, but it, that, that in, in Ethiopia. And I found that really fascinating. And I kind of, I, I felt like I could feel your sort of fingerprints as an, as an anthropologist in, in there. Oh, it was much e dirtier even, earlier on. <laughs> <laughs> even though it didn't come across as, yeah. um, you know, a, a, in an academic sense. I mean, it, it came across in a very personal sense in, in the way you describe them. But I think you did that. I, I thought, I, I enjoyed that. I, I enjoyed, I felt like I'd learned something about Ethiopia but and how Ethiopian to, culture. how to strike that balance, right, between yeah. kind of overburdening or overcomplicating or sounding, uh, I don't know, didactic or something. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a tricky balance. And so that, that for me, just personally, that was a, a challenge, right? And right. To, to work my way through that, I feel, I feel good about that. Yeah. Yeah. I think as well, the, I think something else you did well in the book is, it, you know, and as much as you, you wanted to provide this sort of perspective on, on Islam as a, as a religion, it doesn't come across in this kind of apologetics sense, you know, where you're sort of defending the philosophy. It, it was very personal. It was like a very personal take why on would I, Why should it come across in apologetic sense? You did it well. <laughs> you know, that's my feeling. Like, this is what, what this character inhabits mm -hmm. fully. Why on earth would she have to be apologetic? I suppose yeah. in this climate, you know, it, it breaks my heart that anyone should have to be apologetic. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. Mm. The, now, I want to talk about my favorite character in the book, if we could. Okay. Because I really hope that this character is a real person. So <laughs> there's a scene late in the, late in the story, and I, I don't want to spoil anything, but there's a scene late in the story where Lily and, uh, goes to uh, Diridawa to meet Aziz, who's the man that she loves. And... Uh, she meets him at the home of the grandfather of his friend. Right. And this grandfather is a 98-year-old man with narcolepsy who 
has this zest and zeal for life and he makes fun of Lily for being unable to dance and you can't <laughs> dance as well as me and I'm 98 and look at me go. And yeah. This man. This man is a real man. He was extraordinary. He was the, uh, so the, the first I moved, I lived with two families. The first family I lived with, he was the father of the mother in the household. But there were many, many children because he'd married four times. And so he lived in, Dear Dow, and I did go to meet him, and he had, you know, many men in this part of the world will dye their hair with henna, and it, it's white, so it comes across as a kind of shocking orange, um, because of the prophet, there's an association with the prophet, and um, he, he just had this kind of hearty laugh, and he was like, look at me, and he leapt up, he had been sitting there, you know, kind of cross-legged reading Quran, and he leapt up, and he started running around the courtyard, and he was showing off, and he, he said, I have outrun three wives, <laughs> <laughs> and he was on to his fourth, who was, you know, probably in her 30s, yeah, good um, for him. and I, I've lost track of how many children he'd had, but he was just so alive, and, you know, I met a lot of, uh, he, the, the Harari are a relatively wealthy population, well, rel relatively privileged population in, in an Ethiopian context. I met many, many really old, learned men, you know, yeah. um, quite extraordinary, um, who were revered, you know, because uh, a lot of their later days were spent in kind of religious exercise, religious practice, but mm. he was fascinating, and he was sort of naughty and cheeky <laughs> and provocative. And I'm so glad he was a real person. I, yes. I, I, as soon as I saw that character, I just, I, I crossed my fingers, I gotta, I gotta ask her if this guy is real. One of his sons now lives in Toronto. Oh, really? Yeah, I mean, That's the kids cool. were vast, his son is my age, mm -hmm. the one I'm thinking of, and a doctor. Um, but the, if you have four wives spending multiple decades, you have a vast, the generational sweep <laughs> is quite vast. Yeah, of course. But, yeah. Well, Camilla, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. It's been want, such a pleasure. Thank I you. I want to thank you for writing the novel because I really, I mean, it didn't have zombies, it didn't have giant <laughs> monsters, it didn't have anything in it that I normally read about, and, uh, and uh, I just, I thoroughly enjoyed it, and uh, I want to thank you for joining us, I want to thank you for coming up to Sudbury to, uh, to, to lend some of your time to some of, our, uh, some of our folks here for when they come see the movie, and uh, for, you watching, uh, for, for you watching, I hope you have already bought your tickets to see Sweetness in the Belly, uh, but if you haven't, I'm sorry, you're out of luck. You're going to have to uh, find it on a streaming service, or you're going to have to rent it, or you're going to have to buy Camilla's book, because it really is worth your time. It's a very good read. And uh, uh, the show, if you happen to have tickets, just a reminder, uh, there's two showings of Sweetness in the Belly at Sudbury uh, Indie Cinema on October 22nd at 2 p.m. and 6.30, I think. And uh, Camilla is going to stick around uh, to, to watch the movie, and she's going to uh, chat with you after the, after the showing. Anything else I should add, Beth? Perfect. For Sudbury.com, I'm Mark Gentili. I want to thank you very much for joining us today.